Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is a bit daily yoga podcast because we dive deep into yoga philosophy. And not just the philosophy, but how to apply that philosophy. Kostuba and myself have spent years studying this, trying to apply it to our life the best we can, inquiring from our spiritual teachers, and trying to put it to practical use, and most of all, trying to explain it to people who just, it's, it's sort of like very foreign. So we had the good fortune in our youth to live in ashrams, uh, travel all over the subcontinent of India, and get to live the life of the yogi. And now we're doing the very difficult task of trying to balance that by being in the material world and trying not to be of the material world. And it's a great, it's a great, it's walking a slack line, I will tell you that. But it's fun and it's exciting. And it's filled with great joy and challenge. And it's all based around having community. And we have this beautiful community here um, that uh, that lifts you when you're down and uh, you can reciprocate and lift them when you're up. So again, Facebook people, if you want to join us, you can email uh, um, our ex- executive producer, Mara at wisdom of the sages, 108 at gmail.com. And she'll give you the secret codes to enter into the zoom group, or you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts, um, including Apple podcasts. How are you, Kostuba? I'm doing good this morning. I have a new microphone today. What do you think about that? I've been uh, anxiously awaiting its arrival. Let's see how it goes. I want to thank uh, Mukunda Kishore for donating this microphone, too. I really appreciate mm-hmm. Mukunda Kishore and everybody who's actually giving contributions. If you like what we're doing, it's a community supported podcast. You go to wisdomofthesages.com. Uh, I'm sorry. No, you don't. You go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages and you can give a monthly pledge, and we really appreciate it. Also, some people have been writing, how can I give a pledge, a one-time pledge? You go to um, uh, or PayPal. You can PayPal. What's your email address at Kostuba? Uh, it is Bhakti Collective, B-H-A-K-T-I Collective at gmail.com. Yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. We really appreciate it. Um, so today's question day, where we take questions, it's a big part of our spiritual um walking the spiritual uh, path is you're going to have questions. They're going to come up and people write them in. We do this on Saturdays and tomorrow we have special guest, a great special guest. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll ask him questions. Well, we, yeah, we'll ask him. That's what we do. This is a whole <laughs> game of questions and answers. Okay. It's a whole game of questions and answers, isn't it? That's what the Bhagavatam is too. Questions. It's what life is about really. It is. And, and trying to apply, when you hear something good, you don't just like, yeah, that's a good answer. You apply it to your life. When you apply knowledge, it becomes wisdom. It's that simple. It's that simple. And the the, the Bhagavatam, the book we study, is all questions and answers, answering saintly people, connected people, focused people, and like hearing from them. And like, how can I 
apply that to my life. Can I mention one more series of questions and answers? Yes, sir. The Bhagavad Gita, right? The Bhagavad Gita, another series of questions and answers. Right. So, and just to throw this out there again, that uh, Christmas Day is Gita Jayanti this year, the day that the Bhagavad Gita is spoken. And there's a global worldwide drive to try to distribute 2 million Bhagavad Gita's. And uh, I'm taking part, Rogue is taking part. And if anyone else would like to take part, we've made it really easy for you. If you want to donate a case of Bhagavad Gita's, if you want to send Bhagavad Gita's out to people that you know, they'll send them to you. And all you have to do is call the following number, 650-336-7999. <laughs> Operators are standing by. The operators are actually standing by, although it's kind of early there. They're, they're on the West Coast. so uh, Operators are not standing by. They're sleeping. <laughs> operators will be standing by. So again, the number is 650-336-7993. I and told I, that to some person yesterday to get them to sponsor a case of books. Yeah. Um, and she was like, oh, my God. And they will send them. They'll actually, if you just give them addresses, they'll yeah. send them in the mail to those people. They'll send you know what? how much time that saves? That's all your shopping is done, people. <laughs> One-stop shopping. One-stop shopping. <laughs> yeah. Dad gets a Bhagavad Gita. Mom gets a Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Uncle Thomas gets a Bhagavad Gita. Uncle Carl gets a Bhagavad Gita. Aunt Janet gets a Bhagavad Gita. Boom. <laughs> Sacred wisdom from the East. I think you'd really like it. And you can buy a case for yourself if you want to give them out personally. You can also sponsor a case and they'll send them to whatever you choose. If you want them to go to frontline workers, if you want them to go to hospitals, if you want them to go to prisons, if you want them to go to libraries, they will send them there for you. So you just talk to them, they'll work it all out. My family members have gotten nothing but incense and neck beads for the last 30 years. Really? You been, you, that's what you give them for real? I give them neck beads and incense and they're always like, okay, here it comes. <laughs> they must be rather disappointed in those gifts. They're a little disappointed. Okay. Uh, All right, you ready to get started? Yeah, let's go in. And it looks like I'm first. I got a question for you. That's right. I'm reading you a question. You know, this is a question from a, a real good friend, a regular listener, a sometimes Zoomer, uh, since she's moved to Texas, more of a uh, other. Um, but a dear person, you know, I served for some time with Ashley uh, at the Bhakti Center. Mm -hmm. And um, she was always like, she used to go out and distribute food on the streets, you know, from the Bhakti Center. Just like sacred food, sacred food. We don't just and, distribute food. We distribute sacred food. And there's practically no one behind it. And she was really just going out every week there, you know, just, on, you know, almost on her own. I, I really, I really love Ashley. And uh, but she's going through really, you know, a lot of what Wisdom of the Sage is about is how to apply this wisdom during the difficult periods in life. And Ashley's been going through such a difficult period where her, you know, she's, she has two children and she has one on the way. And her husband was in a horrible motorcycle accident, has been in the hospital for a long time. And it's just like, almost like every day is another surgery, just like going on and on and on and on. And it's been really, oh, any case, let me read the letter and, uh, and I'll be interested to hear your response, Robin. Uh, Ashley writes, I come to you in the midst of a challenging time. As I've written in, asking for prayers, my husband was hit by an 18-wheeler while on his motorcycle two and a half months ago. At this point, he is still hospitalized and bedridden with very little reconstruction done. We have a three-year-old, almost two-year-old, and expecting our third in April. Robert has provided our only income since I became a stay-at-home mom when our three-year-old was born. This is the most difficult time in our lives. Going between my husband in the hospital and my children with family, very little information on what the future holds or even what next week holds. This is one of those life altering events that is often mentioned on the show. I'd love any advice that Bhakti, the wisdom of Bhakti has to get through these times, to stay focused, to minimize anxiety, to trust in God's plan, to remain in God's service and perform his will, to do our very best and get everything out of this event that God intends for us to get. I'm desperate not to miss any opportunity to connect to or follow God by being lost in material comforts and guidance. 
Thank you, Hare Krishna. You are all such inspiring souls. Wow, that is devastating. First, first, I want to do a big group prayer for Ashley's family with a big Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. What a devastating situation. And Ashley, our heart really extends to you. It's, by the way, it's uh, 12 degrees this morning and it's enough to get me miserable. Um, but spring is coming. I can expect it. I can, I can account on it. When you're in spring, sometimes it's still a little cold, a little windy, et cetera. Don't worry. Summer's coming. And in summertime, you can guarantee fall is just around the corner. And guess what? And then it's back to winter again. So this is the change of seasons of life. Life is filled with little ups and little downs and massive ups and massive downs. And as Ashley points out, we talk about this on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, the Bhagavatam itself is about this. The Bhagavatam itself is about there's a massive reversal in this king, a, right? We call the have and have nots. He's a have. He's a have. He's got everything. He's an emperor and he's getting everything taken away from him. He's cursed to die. And um, it's this massive reversal in his life. How do we handle it? And the Bhagavatam is about finding a steadiness in between summer and winter. You can't canoe. You can't go mountain biking. You can't, right? It's freezing. We're building fires. We're plowing the snow. We're shoveling the walk. You're in an incredible winter season right now. Raising three kids. I don't care if you have a team of people raising three kids. Raising three kids under five is enough to exhaust anyone. And you can't even explain it to somebody who has no kids. It is like... You want to pull the hair out of your head. I know it's joyful. I know it's fun. I know this is the precious times of life. It's exhausting. When you take away one of those persons from that mix, it's even more exhausting. So the first thing is uh, just understand that seasons will change. Things will come back around. And you're at a very focused time. I find that in my life, on my spiritual path, Krishna likes to keep me practically destitute, practically destitute. And destitution in the material world is such a horrible, almost pathetic and almost sad place to be. And destitution in the spiritual world can be one of the highest places you can be. Because when you're destitute, you have no one else to turn to but Krishna, right? And so Krishna, you can see Krishna's hand in everything, a divine hand. If you're new to the show, hey, replace Krishna with higher power, with God, superior force, the universe, you know, uh, Jesus, whatever you want to call your higher power. But we say Krishna, and this just means the all attractive one. When you're destitute like this, you can really, with a heartfelt sincerity, reach out and pray. And you will see that divine hand in everything. Um, there'll be people that will come forward. There will be a way financially to move forward. But what you're going to have to do is cut the fat. You know, um, I was talking to my wife about this question this morning too. She gave really great advice. She's saying it was great. It was like, it's a good time to just focus on the main thing. We talk about service. Service doesn't have to be out there. Service is right there. You got three kids, loving up those three kids, right? There's nothing in one sense you could probably do for your husband at this point, except visit him and support like that. And you're doing it. And now practice giving a steadiness to those kids' life without dad. And I know you have some backup because I've been back and forth with Ashley since this has happened. She's got some backup with some loving, supportive family members. And um, your focus right now is on this core, you know? Make sure you take, and you know, as far as your sadhana, we have, you know, in regular life, we have a spiritual sadhana. We chant japa, we, 
that was some certain times of reading and meditation, etc. Now all that stuff has to be done on your uh, on your uh, on your time in between. You're driving to the hospital, then you can listen to listen to wisdom literature or lectures or back back um, listen to pod, old podcasts, etc. You will find they speak to you. Find a verse from the Gita and repeat it. Repeat it all day long. That's your verse today. Find one verse. That's your verse today. Um, if you can chant, if you have time to chant Japa, which is very difficult with three children, make a make a minimal commitment. But really, in loving and nurturing and caring for kids, I've heard Radha Swami say this to me again and again, especially to my to my wife. Loving those kids is a massive service. Don't underestimate just loving those kids and giving those kids bhakti. That's a massive service. So I think you're doing great. And um, please don't beat yourself up about it. Your letter is so amazingly Krishna conscious that it's almost like, wow, she already gets this whole thing. It's quite beautiful to witness. Did you get that vibe, Gustuba, reading this email? I totally got that vibe. Um, yeah, that I, I can see where her mind is at. And you know, it's, this is the nature of life in this world. And, and I like the way that she says, you know, this is the most difficult time in our lives. And this is like a life altering event. Or you could say like a heart altering event in a sense, too, if you want to say it like that, you know, it's, sure. it's that it's that um, we have this little fantasy in our mind that um, we come to spiritual life, and then everything becomes easy. Right. You know, <laughs> but what we see, and, and this may sound a little scary, but a lot of times the way that God works in our lives is that he just like, it's like we're a towel and he's just wringing us out, you know? And uh, so even though our faith is in the right place and our heart is in the right place, you know, God makes it so that we lose our faith in the material world. You know, like, you know. Sure. There's a romance that my husband will protect me. Yeah. My I, spouse will protect me. My home will always be there. Yeah. And then when you're sincere, he just starts to snap it away. You know, I think of Dropity and she's got not only one husband as a provider and a protector, she's got five. She's got five husbands <laughs> and none of them could protect her. And they were the most powerful husbands and they were the wealthiest husbands. And, you know, she had beauty and fame and, and you know, all, all the things that someone wants materially. And then there she was turning to one for shelter, turning to the next for shelter, turning to, turning to the elders for shelter, turning to the rulers for shelter, turning to everyone for shelter, nobody giving it to her. Right. And it, and it's, it's something like that, that in the end, you know, in the end, our pain and our suffering, you know, if, if our, if we have our, our head kind of screwed on straight, it, we realize, God, I see what you're doing to me. You're saying that I have no other shelter, but you ultimately, mm -hmm. there is no other shelter, but you, and, you know, that's what we all go through at the time of death too, right? Where everything is taken away. Sure. But I, I agree with you. I think Ashley's, you know, she's got a really deep, strong spiritual foundation that she's going through this with. It doesn't mean that I don't feel any less pain hearing this, you know? Sure. But uh, I, I respect her and I appreciate uh, her approach. Yeah. I, I, you know, bhakti and spiritual life does relieve material pain initially. And then because we're on a path to get purified, not just to find an escape, you'll get some pain again because that pain is going to bring her to the next level of where she has to go. And when she makes it through this, she's going to be, you know, eligible for, you know, sainthood in the Catholic church, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All she's got to do is perform two miracles. I think that's what you have to get to. To get to the title of saint, you need two miracles in the Catholic church. Yeah. So who knows? Um, can I ask you a question, Prabhu? Sure. This is from Rohini Matson. Harry Krishna. This year I have been dealing with a lot of hostility from people both in my personal life and at work for being a white woman who practices Vaishnavism. Hmm. The company I work for has been attacked for cultural appropriation multiple times. We sell jewelry that represents all truths. How to navigate this? 
My under what does that mean? Jewelry that represents all truths. I think it's drawing from different spiritual traditions. Okay. How do the, I navigate the inspiration, this? you know, is is drawing from different wisdom traditions. My understanding is that we are not our bodies, but this year has really put me in my place and shown me that people may see color. My boyfriend is also Indian, and a lot of people have expressed their dislike for the mixing of races. If you have any any advice, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. What have we created, huh? What is going on this year? <laughs> yeah. Well, the Rohini's name of getting rid of hate. We've become so hateful. Mm. Rohini's a friend also. Um, and who, another friend who I really appreciate. And um, you, you, uh, yeah, it's true, you know, this year has been a, a weird year, right? It's... um. It's almost like, you know, well, let me start here. You know, Rohini, Rohini's, she's actually like an award-winning uh, jewelry designer. Is, is she white or is she white? Yes. She, yeah. But she was born into a Vaishnava family. Okay. okay. Vaishnava, it's, if you're new to it, it means person practicing bhakti from childhood because your yeah. parents were practicing. Yeah. So hence the name Rohini. All right. So here's a person that was actually born into the culture that she's representing through her jewelry. Even though she was born with white skin, she was born into that culture, raised with it, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and so, first of all, she, she begins by saying just the fact that she's practicing Vaishnavism, just the, pra the fact that she's practicing Bhakti Yoga, she's being criticized by people for that, even though she was born into it, you know. Right, right. Um, and and then then there, there's the next question about okay well in her in her livelihood you know she was born into that culture and she drew inspiration from that culture and she expressed it in an artistic way through her jewelry she's being criticized for that right um, and and on top of that she has a a boyfriend who's Indian someone you know it's is come on it, it wouldn't be unlikely that she would find someone that shares the same values as her amongst Indian people. And she's being criticized for that. So now they're saying you can't intermarry. What are they talking about? This is the this is the idea of where yeah. this is where it all brought us now. Yeah. So so th in in my mind, things can get so skewed, right? Uh, she's a person not only born to this culture, but she has a deep appreciation for the culture. She represents it with dignity and with honesty. Um, and, and you know, I often think back to this. You know, cultural appropriation is a real thing, and there's some horrible examples of it. But What's, can you explain a horrible example of it? Well, you, well, like let's just take the, you know within the world of yoga, you know to take a take to take a, a tradition that's meant for entirely you know like purifying one's character and and um, and leading to like higher and higher states of you know spiritual attainment and to take it cheaply, present it as you know how to get sexy or some other you know. Um, minimizing its its value and then profiting off that. Truthfully, anything that 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 um, deviates from the traditional teachings, you're culturally appropriating it yeah. for your and, own and thing. Particularly if you're profiting off of it like that. And so, I appreciate the that concern, and I appreciate when people speak to that concern, but. Just as you're saying, like this, it's not just this year, but it's all manifesting like so strong in this year, right? The things get so skewed that people are taking. This is the way I see that. That often it plays out like this, that people's own impurities are playing out, and they're using the, the mechanisms that are there that are actually meant for compassion, but what's being what's actually expressed is their own animosity or envy or the, their own darkness within. Sure. Now, now one, there was a time when Srila Prabhupada, um, he was, a letter was written to him about some people that they weren't exactly like followers of the Krishna conscious movement, but they were kind of connected. And they, um, in their um, foolishness, they thought that it would be wise to blow up a slaughterhouse. Right? Blow up? Like yeah, bomb? Yeah, like bomb, to bomb a slaughterhouse. It is a, what happened actually is that they ended up screwing up and they actually blew up and a couple of them actually died 
I never heard this story. Yeah. And, and um, but someone wrote to Srila Prabhupada about these people. And what he wrote was he said, it is not our aim anywhere to build bombs for any purpose. This, and this is the point. He says, this same mentality is involved in trying to blow up the slaughterhouse is the same mentality that's there in the meat eating, right? In other words, he's saying, although they were like putting themselves forward as like agents of justice. Sure. The way Prabhupada saw was, no, 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 that the same kind of um, callous or destructive dark mentality that goes into the slaughterhouse, he saw in the same people that were trying to blow up the slaughterhouse. Sure. And so he said, such things will not stop. Uh, such things will not stop people from unnecessary animal slaughter. It is only by educating people in the science of Krishna consciousness that they will automatically develop all good qualities. Yeah, before trying to make everybody else's bed, make your own bed. And and so, you know, I'm 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 reminded, you know, I I've shared this before, but there's one time where I brought um a really wonderful yoga teacher named A. G. Mohan and his wife Indra. Sure. Sure. Right. Now, th these are traditional yogis from South these India. The, Real these Brahmas. are the uh, the most learned in the teachings of Krishna Namacharya. Uh, they they studied with Krishna Namacharya five days a week, I think it is, for thirty years. The couple. Yeah. Um. Go on, and you it, brought him to the Bhakti Center. No, I brought him to the Brooklyn Hare Krishna Temple. And it was on the day after Ratiyacha, so it was like a packed house. And I brought him up to the balcony, and we're looking down on like, I don't know how many people went, it was jammed, so it's probably like at least a thousand people in there, right? That fits more than a thousand. That yeah, maybe 1,200, 1,400 people, something like that. And it was absolutely beautiful. It was people of all races, you know. All com completely mixed, you know, there's Indian, white people, black people, Hispanic people, Asian, everything, you know, they were, you know, many of them dressed in Indian clothes and saris and in dhotis and so on. They were doing kirtan. The kirtan was tremendous. You know, I remember Gauravani was leading. Everybody's dancing back and forth. It was a beautiful sight absolutely be everyone enthusiastic from their heart together united um absorbed deeply spiritually and then they did a uh, a drama of mahabharata on a big stage and really that drama was performed mostly by african-american bhakti yogis right P you know playing the roles of yudhishthira and Draupadi and you know and all of that and ag mohan again like super traditional you know, um, you know, Indian, South Indian, Brahmin, yogi, both he and his wife, Indra, they turned to me and practically like their jaws were like dropped and their eyes were like wide open. And he said to me, even in India, I do not see this kind of devotion in the temples. Wow. Right. And then he just started to praise Srila Prabhupada that he could take this culture and bring it to the Western world and share it with, with the whole world, with all kinds of people, you know, he saw that as, as not as cultural appropriation. He saw that as the fulfillment of the culture, right? That that's right. That. the fulfillment of Vedic culture is to spread knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, 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 and the knowledge is also conveyed through the culture. Sure. And, and it's got and, and, nothing necessarily to do with a border or a country or, or a DNA or, or, or anything like that. So, you know, Rohini, she's a person with a deep, not only, first of all, born into the culture, you know, but even if she wasn't with a deep appreciate, a genuine appreciation for the culture and her designs are a product of her own cre creativity, you know, withdraws from all kinds of influences. And she shares the beauty of that culture with the world through her work. And people are going to come along and people with their own darkness inside are going to come along and say, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't practice Vaishnavism. What are you talking about? If you go to the heart of Vaishnavism, it's calling for every living being to connect with this. And you're going to step in between that, you know? So, so you know, um, 
my you know my heart goes out to to people that get you know um end up the targets of this kind of thing i see it as you know again i know that there's real serious concerns about um cultural appropriation but uh things just get ridiculous at a certain point you know the, the way we've that people hit, are, are that throwing point. around their their um their accusations and their in, in one sense it's their envy or their animosity you know the yoga is meant bhagavatam says you know that this is meant for people that have um given up envy right it's for the non-envious it's a near much saranam satam you know for people that are pure-hearted and given up all animosity you know th this philosophy will be understandable for for them that's the second verse in the bhagavatam so, you know, I, it, it just makes me think of something, and I'll just share this, is that Prabhupada told a story. It's a really weird story, <laughs> so bear with me. But he said, I'll, I'll read a verbatim, okay? And he says, in my young days, we had one teacher. So Prabhupada went to these British schools in Calcutta when he was growing up at the turn of the century. He said, in my young days, we had one teacher. Whenever there was any misbehavior between the boys, the teacher would stop them and bring them out in front of the class. He would make them stand face to face and each take hold of the ears of the other. <laughs> okay. That's, um, a that's a British school, it sounds. Okay. Yeah, some weird thing. And, and, uh, and on his order, make them pull. What? Uh, so the one he is pulling and the other is hurting, so he pulls back even harder and each one is pulling and crying but they cannot let go because the teacher is ordering, no, you cannot stop. You must go on pulling. Similarly, Maya brings us, brings together one Churchill and one Hitler, now rascal pull, and neither can stop. And the foolish people glorify them. Hmm. Now, just right in that little paragraph, in that little story, you know, we can get a, we can, there's a lot to understand about the nature of the material world is that we come in here with our issues and our problems and our envy. And by envy, I don't just mean like wanting something that someone else has, but also like the older meaning of that term and how Srila Prabhupada used a lot is just animosity towards others. And we bang into each other and we try to hurt each other. And we're trying to hurt each other all the time. You know, material nature is forcing one to battle against the other. And in spiritual life means I'm gonna let go of that. I'm going to start to really care about the other more, even more than I start to think of myself, I'm going to think of the other. And that's spiritual thought. You know, that's the basis of spiritual. That's this, it's when we start to think like that, that mm -hmm. we can begin to understand what is what. And so Rohini, you know, as far as your business, I think your business is beautiful. I think you're drawing from the, not only the culture that you grew up in, but a culture that you have a lot of appreciation for. Um, as far as you're practicing Vaishnavism, that's your that's the right of every living being in existence, according to the bhakti tradition, and don't allow anyone to tell you any different. As far as uh, having a boyfriend from, you know, from the Indian race, just walk past that stuff, you know, just like... Anyone who says that is a racist. <laughs> anyone who fact. says you're racist for dating an Indian is a racist. Yeah. And, 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 um, and just try to understand even without holding any animosity towards those people that are throwing this energy at you, mm. that the nature of this world is we're all here foolishly trying to hurt each other, right? Due to our misconceptions, we're fighting with one another and battling with one another. And it comes out in all kinds of varieties of ways. It comes out as overt racism. It comes out in this uh, another kind of covered envy in the name of justice. It'll come out in so many ways. People will screw up every good thing. Those, you know, even 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 fighting for justice, they'll screw it up with their own darkened hearts. You know, so, um, you know, I think Rohini, I think you're a great person. I think your art is great. I think you're talented, and um, and just go on and and, and try to um, try not to let it affect you. You know, and try not and beyond that, try not to even hold it against those people. Just understand that the nature of this world is it screws up our heads, and people do all kind of stupid stuff. Do you have a website for her art? I think it's such a jewelry, but I think such she has her jewelry. own. I think it's Rohini. It's something. If you Google Rohini Matson jewelry, because I know she works for such as like one of their like nice uh, the, one of the like top designers. 
And I think she also does her own stuff maybe on the side. I'm not sure. Nice. Great answer, Kasub. Thank you, Ravinath. Okay. You. Uh, now I got a question for you. Okay, let's see if I can. This is an anonymous question. Anonymous. That means we can't say their name. <laughs> that means I don't even know their name. Yeah. Uh, oh, this was an interesting one. This is the one where I think you and I, we got to like, we got to do more for these kind of people. You ready? Yeah. I am an other, a Californian, and also <laughs> listening from the beginning listener. So I'm sorry if this question has been asked before. I became a Bhakti Yogi and have been listening to your podcast since the beginning of this year. To say that you have positively changed my life is an understatement. Thank you. Thank you. Anonymous person. My question is, how does one be happy in this material life while embodying a spiritual life? I often struggle with purpose because I feel like I have one foot in the spiritual world and one foot in the material world. Anybody feel like that? Um, yep. I, I find myself being pretty negative in the material world because what is the point in any of this anyway? I'm not motivated by prestige, financial wealth, or raising a family. I have a fledging Ayurvedic chefing business that I just don't have the material ambition to make big. I remind myself that bhakti is about sharing love and the teaching of the teachings of the Bhagavatam. I get it, but I still don't feel happy in this material world. Am I just not meant to feel happy in the material world? Thank you for spreading bhakti and making it so easily accessible during these times of isolation. Mm. Thank you for this question, anonymous. Um, first of all, we are, it's okay to be happy. First of all, I just want you to know that it's okay to be happy. That is our birthright to be happy, to be joyous. But it's not, but to be happy in the material world, to get, to derive our happiness from, from matter, that's, it's limited, it's temporary. So in, in Bhakti, we find our happiness from first finding, here's the deal. We need to do something to contribute to this world in the first place. This person sounds a little depressed. Mm -hmm. So they have to like first figure out like, what is that joy in my life? What is that, what, what, what things can I do that are joyous? And generally when we really dig down, it's something that has to do with some type of connection. And sharing joy is such a beautiful thing. I think personally for myself, what we do here every morning is incredibly joyful for me. I wake up early. I wake up at 3.30 in the morning, generally, excited to do the show at 5 a.m. You know what I mean? It's um, if, I, if, if, if I had a mundane job or if I was a lumberjack and said, okay, you're going to wake up at 3.30 in the morning, you're going to put your boots on, you're going to get out there, you're going to get your chainsaw, you're going to cut down wood. Three, I'd be like, really, man? I, I mean, how do you pay a person for that job? You can't really. So when you learn to love what you do, there is no more, oh, Monday morning, right? You, you have to learn, you have to find that joy. And then you have to do that joy. Uh, and, and, and one part, and you'll, you'll get this from a 12 step program. One part of that recovery is you're assisting other people in their recovery. Now you don't have to do a podcast. You don't have to be on the corner of a, the New York city street and sell distributing Bhagavad Gita's. You have a community around you. So the first step is to connect with our own joy and our own personal integrity and to live that. To may, and maybe you forgot what it is. Maybe it's not Ayurvedic chefing. Maybe that's not your joy, but it could be. It could be making that food, preparing that food, showing how to offer that food. I guess if it's catering, it's not showing how to offer, but offering that food to Krishna and then distributing that food with love. That itself is devotional service. That's a massive part of devotional service. Cooking with a meditation and offering that. And you can do that as a mother or a father for your family or for each other uh, or a spouse cooking as an, with a deep intention of love as an offering and then offering it to your family. So you're sort of in the right place if that's your thing. It, 
chef, you might have just picked an occupation. Well, it seems like a good job, but it might not be your passion. People need to find what they're passionate about at life. And that comes to figuring out what you're good at in this life. And we all have some unique contribution that we are meant that we are meant to offer back. If I take one key out of a piano, that piano, that piano key has very little use in most, most things. But when it's connected to the piano, it has incredible, perfect use. Everybody has a contributing offering built inside them. And we're sometimes disconnected because we've been on sort of like a fast track scooped up by a headhunter. Now I'm working this massive career and I never stop to ask why. So if you're falling into that category, you might have to put on the brakes and think, who am I? What am I here to do? What is my, what is, what am I good at? And how can I give back with that? Now that might not be something like some people say, well, I'm born to act. I'm an actor. I'm a thespian. Hey, you might be that thing. You might be an actor, but you, and, and you're pounding the pavement in Hollywood. Guess what? Maybe you're not meant to be Brad Pitt. You're meant to just do local theater. If you're actually born to act, then it shouldn't matter if you're getting all the validation and a Hollywood celebrity and walking down a red carpet. Maybe it means that you just act in a local theater because that is your passion and you find your money from another source. So that, that, that's another way to go with that answer. Um, but uh, I understand to get excited about the material world. No, I can't get excited about the material world. W why? So I can make a little money and lose a little money? So I can make, get, invest in this and lose it? Or to, to, I mean, we, a lot of us have walked through this in our mind already. Okay, I make a big amount of money and now what? It all boils down to a big, now what? Now what do I do? I've got the money. I've got the house. I got the car. Now what? I've got the, uh, I've got the perfect spouse. I've got the perfect kid, 3.5 kids, <laughs> right? I've got the, I've got the dog. Now what? What do I do to live? And we find our joy in the contribution of our joy. But first, we got to connect with our joy. What do you think about that, Kostuba? I'm with you, Robin. Are you with me? Yeah. She's a Cal or she or he is a Californian. Californians, they get their special others. Others are the people who listen on the podcast. They're out there. They're out there, the others. They're out there on a regular basis listening, snooping. But the California are special because they really can't get on Zoom if they want to because it's like two in the morning. At, when we do it at five, it's two in the morning there. So they get a hmm. special title. The Californians. Here's a question for you, Kostuba, from okay. an anonymous Zoomer. Okay. That means we might know them. They may be with us right now. Now, yeah, oh. but they're anonymous. It could be any. They're look around, all are. Zoom people. Look around. It could be any of these people here. <laughs> one of you people. It's one of you. Maybe it's even some people are watching on Zoom with a cup as a couple. It could be the couple. It could, could be one, one of the couple. people in the couple, and you don't even know it. Could it's. Be that person right next to you. It could be Mara for all we know. <laughs> okay, ready? <laughs> okay, it could be you, Kostuba. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be tricky if I did that answer a question to Raghunath, but I don't want him to know it's me. I feel my relationship to Krishna is often a game of hide and seek. That sounds fun. <laughs> In the last few weeks, Krishna has been hiding very well, specifically for me, not from anyone else. I miss my friend Krishna. At what point does one reset and or upgrade their sadhana? And is it selfish to do so? There's a part of me that says my spiritual practice is to be of service to God and to others. Uh, so to change it would technically be egotistical for the reasoning of feeling left out. Or is this a patience thing? I don't know. I miss my friend and my heart just feels really heavy. Where are your thoughts on this? Thank you, Kostuba. Krishna has been hiding, showing up and hiding. <laughs> He's very, very naughty. Yeah. 
Uh, you got to get a curtain and you got to close it real quick. You open, you close it quick. <laughs> For those that have been to the Bunky Bihari Temple in Vrindavan, they'll understand that others may not. Um, okay, you know, I think th I'm just you know I don't know who this is and I and, and you know to go deeper into this I'd probably have to ask them some questions but so I'm just going to speak from what I'm here you know I'm going to speak what I can on what I'm from based on what I'm hearing right here and I would say this is that if it seems like Krishna is a little missing in your life then it's time to go deeper now when we say for instance that um he's krishna's been hiding you know really my guess would be it's not so much that he's hiding from us but we're getting distracted you know because all if you want to connect with krishna all you have to do is open up the krishna book open up the bhagavatam open up the bhagavad he's right there right uh non-different from entirely present chant the name he's there but there may be periods in life where we go through, we, it feels like he's distant. You know, there, there are examples in Shastra where like, say with Narada where Krishna actually appears before him, our Lord Vishnu appears before him and says, okay, I'm going to disappear now, you know? Uh, and, and in that disappearance, it's a way to cultivate a deeper presence of feeling God within. And so that's there, that's always there too. So like, if you feel God's absent, then cultivate, feeling God within. Um, but, but what I, I think what I, my most important message here would be that it's one thing to, to have some budding affection for God in one's heart. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's a precious thing. And we want to protect that and cultivate that as much as we can. But we have to, but this path will require that we go deeper and deeper and deeper. And we really need to to say, okay, well, is, is Krishna my friend? And am I a friend to Krishna? Or how much do my thoughts and my behavior betray my friendship to Krishna? You, you understand what I'm saying? In, in other sure. words, I, I, in a sentimental way, I like to think of Krishna as my friend, but actually, you know, everything is Krishna's property and I'm trying to take it without sharing it with him, even with him, you know, am I really a friend, you know, in all my thoughts and all my actions, right. or am I calmly trying to exploit his energy for my own separate endeavors and separate enjoyment and separate comforts, etc. And that's where spiritual life starts to get deep. And that's, and that's where that connection will get more and more real and less superficial. So there's one wonderful piece of advice that was shared by Shil Prabhupada's guru, uh, Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and he said, don't try to see Krishna, but try to act in such a way that he will see you, that he will want to see you. That's right? a great statement. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of wisdom in that statement. Um, so, I, you know, um, I, I appreciate your desire to see Krishna. I appreciate your feelings of friendship towards Krishna. Um, and, and my advice would be like, always be ready to take that step. What, what's the next step that I need to take? where my surrender to God becomes more real, you know, um, become, and, and if you're always willing to make those steps, you're going to feel the presence of Krishna in your life. And if for some reason you don't, then it's going to be a greater impetus to go still deeper. So uh, the person asked, um, at what point does one reset or upgrade their sadhana? And is it selfish to do so? It's not selfish whatsoever to do. That is, that is, that is selflessness when you give yourself, you know, to, to deeper and deeper contemplation on God. And, um, and, and then as you also said, is this a patience thing? Yes, it is definitely a patience thing. You know, very important verse uh, from Rupa Goswami in his Upadesha Amrita, the Nectar of Instruction. Utsahadnis chaya dharyat, tat tat karma pravartanat, sangatyagat, sato vrte, sadbir bhakti prasidyati that there's six principles favorable for the execution of pure devotional service of bhakti. One is be enthusiastic. Two is endeavoring with confidence. And three, being patient, right? Four is acting according to the regulative principles. Five is abandoning association of non-devotees. And six is following in the footsteps of the previous acharyas. These six principles undoubtedly assure the complete success 
of pure devotional service. But commonly those those first three are mentioned together. Utsahan Nischaya Dharya, being enthusiastic and endeavoring with confidence, but also being patient. So if you're saying, well, I am being enthusiastic and I am endeavoring with confidence, you also need to be patient. Mm. Right? It takes it takes some time. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the endeavor. And I think, uh, you know, if there's one thing to meditate on, don't try to see Krishna. Don't expect him to manifest in front of you at every moment. But try to act in such a way that he will see you. And a lot of that has to do with being willing to go deeper into mm-hmm. our own minds and deeper into our, our own hearts and be really honest with ourselves and say, what is that next step I need to take? What is it that I need to let go of? What is it that I need to embrace, you know, to come closer to God? Is All right. that a deserve and then desire type of answer? Yeah, I suppose you could say that, deserve right? Deserve like, then desire. Yeah, like we're reading in, we're reading now in Bhagavatam how, you know, Lord Brahma, he sat for a very long time in meditation before he had that vision of Krishna or vision of Vishnu, right? It's not, so we, it's, 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 it's not cheap. It's not cheap. Yeah. Okay. All right, Raghunath. You ready for another? It's nine. Eight, it's nine. Do you need to run off and teach a class or something? Uh, I can do one more. Okay. Oh, well, this is a big one, though. You ready? This uh, is the person. It was this question that's thinking we need to do more for these kind of people. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, this comes from Jay Neela via the Patreon message board. He writes. I am a new I am a new fan of your podcast as well as a new pursuer of Vedic knowledge. Although much of what has come to my understanding so far, especially from the Bhagavad Gita, only confirms my own views on consciousness that I've had since birth. My family has seen my confusion and struggle in a world of ego masks. Now, with the information presented in the Vedas, it is even it has even come as confirmation to my father that our conversations we had while I was a young boy on reincarnation and love were all true. Very interesting, yeah? Yeah, spiritual kid. I'm now a man of 27 years old, a business owner, and well settled into American society. My question for both of you is this. Oh, I, I'm supposed to get in on this a little too. Okay. In the revelation that my spirit's knowledge has always been true, and I understand these ideas in layers that only become sweeter as I continue to eat the fruit, I would like to seek out a way to dedicate my life in study of the Vedas. My family is now 100% supportive of this. Now realizing that there is even a text that speaks of the sort of consciousness I have been trying to help them grasp for years. My father is open to maintaining responsibilities for my business and shows both his financial support and willingness to help me set foot on my journey. This is a journey within myself that I'm willing to take even without guidance. My previous plan was to purchase property. And we can really test your new pop guard here, right? My previous plan to purchase property (laughs) in a rural part part of the woods and go deep into meditation. My previous plan was to purchase property. And the big peppers, but rum rock rhymes. (laughs) My previous plan was to purchase property in the rural part of the woods and go into deep meditation for 12 years, for 12 years time. Being a fan of the uh, Joe Rogan Experience podcast, my father has brought you to my attention and would prefer I go to India or find a guru who can guide me. Hmm. Where would you suggest I seek such guidance, a guru or a scholar willing to indulge in a deep conversation with me that will only get deeper past the material realm? Hmm. I see a world full of gurus. I see a world full of paper money with faces. I have been fortunate and I'm not attached to these things, but I do not see an enlightened face in sight. My spirit still tells me to go to the woods and look within. No mortal man will have the knowledge I seek, but I figure there must be a secret. And maybe as men who have dedicated their lives to this and really are just perceived versions of myself in the material world, you might have a suggestion for a young man seeking to dive into the deep end of the dark blue the dark blue you know um <laughs> J- jay or um, i'm not sure if his name is jay or jai is beautiful beautiful sentiment yes just like when you just like when a person starts up a marriage it's got it's, there's a romance to it um when a person has children there's a romance to it 
But um, having a marriage is also a lot of work. Having children is a lot of work. And the, the romantic bubble gets punctured quick. And it really comes to a lot of work. And I'm not saying you're not, you're adverse to work, but you can start by being right where you are. Um, for example, Radhana Swami, our teacher, has a very big, beautiful ashram, maybe 200 monks living there. Sometimes people get very enthusiastic and in the same mood you're in right now, say, I want to live in the temple. I want to become a monk. I'm, I'm studying at an engineering school. I'm finding it so much maya, so much illusion, so much temptation. I want over it. I want to live in the temple. And they have a strict policy. First, you fix your edge finish your education, and then we can talk about it. And while you're being educated, you practice these principles. You practice celibacy, right? You mm -hmm. control your senses and mind. You're incredibly careful about what you put in your mouth. You know, you, when you cook, you offer your food to Krishna. They, they put them on such a high program. They're already on a very difficult uh, educational program, but then they put them on a the very high spiritual program. And they monitor, how are you doing now? How are you doing in the material world applying these spiritual principles? These guys are like chanting 16, like two hours of japa meditation every day. I, I remember I gave a class once, Radha Swami had me give a class at IIT, which is this very, very distinguished engineering university. So I thought I was going to deal with a bunch of college frat losers personally. <laughs> And, um, and after I gave this class and I was so big on myself and what a dynamic class that was, I said, has anybody uh, heard of, you know, this is in India, in Bombay. Has anybody heard of uh, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra? Because we're going to chant it. Everyone raised their hand. I was like, um, does anybody chant Japa? They all raised their hand. And I said, how much Japa do you chant? One guy's like, uh, 16 rounds, about two hours a day. Like everybody in the whole room was chanting for six hours. And I was like, oh my God, I'm dealing with a very high level group here. So I'm saying, I love the idea of the woods. It's very romantic. It sounds very cool. I love the idea of going to India. I did that when I was 22 years old. It's very romantic and very cool. That being said, there's so much work you can do right now. And, you know, we can go into more detail about that. But adding Japa to your life, controlling the sexual energy controlling the media and what you consume on a regular basis and practice that um practice reading that these from, books yeah reading the yeah. bhagavatam reading and imb imbibing this stuff on a regular basis and continuing on with your business you don't have to renounce your business yet and then there will be a point where you say you know what i get it there's a balance because arjuna in the bhagavad gita also wanted to quit work and just become a renunciate and krishna said no 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 you have a duty out there in the world to serve, and you can also do it in higher consciousness. I was the same way. I gave up music, and I realized I was born to do do music and write music. And I, and many people benefited from that music. And if I was to give it up, it would have been a type of false renunciation. The Bhagavatam is there, and it will give a lot of light. You don't have to travel outside your home to get the Bhagavatam. Um, but that being said, pilgrimage is great. It's, I find it necessary for my spiritual life. Um, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's one thing I do for my students. I take them on pilgrimage every year. And you know why? It changes you. Um, so I'm not saying don't go to India. Don't find living gurus and teachers. But first do the pre, uh, preliminary work. I think hearing wisdom of the sages, we are actually, if you just go out and look for any old guru, You'll, you won't even know how the appropriate, like if I say, go get me an avocado. If you've never seen what an avocado should be like, you might buy a hard avocado. Well, this is an avocado. And then you bite into it. It's like, this is the most disgusting thing ever. If you've ever eaten a hardened avocado. So it, first you have to have to have the discernment to figure out what is a ripe avocado. Hearing from the Bhagavatam or wisdom of the sages every day, you learn to discern what is guru, what is an actual teacher. And what is a nice dude or woman, you know, wrapped in robes? We're not interested in, we want, we want someone who embodies truth and lives truth. So I, I appreciate your sentiment, but um, there's a lot of work to be done right now. And that way, when you do go to India or do go on pilgrimage or do meet the right person, you will have the appropriate questions for them. You won't just waste, 
your time and their time. You won't waste your time in the wood. If you're in the woods sitting alone, but you can't control your tongue, your belly, and your genitals, who cares? Who cares? You're in the woods. Big deal. You could, like, you could be like a redneck living in the for living in, you know, living in the backwoods. Big deal. You know, we're, but there is a way to go about living in solitude. Also, so it's 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 beautiful sentiment, and um, it's got to be mixed with some pra very practical uh, add-ons to your spiritual life. Anything else do you want to share with that, Kostub, or should no, we? I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm, you know, maybe it, I, Jay sounds like a really interesting person, and maybe even if they wrote in more to us, like, you know, on the side, we could try to help them a bit, help him a bit. But, um, I, you know, I agree. I, I don't, you know, the paths of yoga that I've seen as effective um, and what's recommended in Bhagavad Gita are, are not going off into the woods, which I, I, I do get the, um, the romantic side of that, but I don't know if that's what really helps. Um, I, I think it's, it's the rare person that, that benefits that way. Whereas all people can benefit, um, through karma and bhakti yoga and, and living in society and being responsible. Um, but that being said, you know, uh, going to India or meeting certain people, you know, could be a very valuable life experience it, living as a monk for some time, you know, could be a very valuable, maybe even living his whole life. And maybe that's what he wants to do. There's all kinds of possibilities. One, one thing that I would just uh, bring up though, is it's real when, when, when someone can begin to see the futility of material life, mm. we just have to be a little bit careful about becoming judgmental of the people that we think don't see that, you know, and, um, the, the deeper spiritual sentiments, one is beginning to feel like not an aversion to everyone, but like kind of an affinity with everyone, you know, even people that aren't so spiritually developed necessarily but one can still see beauty in them and still see sweetness in them and so on. Nice. And um, I, I think the, the, the path of that cold renunciation of wandering off alone, it, it, it commonly hardens one's heart rather than softens one's heart. Um, so just things to consider, but um, yeah, you know, as Raghunath was saying, you know, are you, you know, it sounds like he's got, he's probably doing some serious practice, but like, yeah, you know, just, reading these books deeper and, and finding that right person that you can inquire from that'll help you understand and help you apply it. I want to meet him. Yeah. Let, let, let's meet up. Let's meet uh, up, Jay. Write, write more to us, uh, Jay, and, uh, and we'd love to communicate with you more. Thanks everybody for joining us. If you're listening on Facebook. Thanks. Join our party. This is happening every day, 5 a.m. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. Saturday and Sunday. Email Mara at wisdom of the sages one away to gmail.com and you can join our little club. Thanks, everybody. Hey, I'm teaching yoga right after this class at 10 o'clock. Go to supersoulyoga.com and sign up for my yoga class at 10 a.m. today and tomorrow. Also, um, if you like this show and you listen to the show regularly, if you're one of those others out there, go to Apple Podcasts and give us a review and tell us your journey tell us your journey home we can all read it there on apple podcast uh it, it makes a difference um also we are available on youtube if you like if you don't if you like to see us on youtube subscribe to that channel comment on that channel and thanks for all your support again a one-time donation you could go to bhakti collective at gmail.com or join our patreon uh our patreon com community at patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages Thanks. This is the fun part of the show. We just dance around the computer. <laughs>